At the end of chapter 20, as I already mentioned, Paul is in this little kind of coastal town of Miletus. It's about 20 miles south of Ephesus, this big place of many churches, or at least a church with many leaders, and he's been meeting with them. And as we studied from verse 17 of chapter 20 down to the end, chapter 38, Paul called the elders of the church, or the pastors, and he talked about his past ministry, and he talked about his present ministry, and he talked about his future, and they were warned about wolves and so forth. So when you come to chapter 21, it's a continuation. He's leaving those pastors on that spot on the beach in Miletus, and he's going to be continuing his journey to Jerusalem. Now, the big picture is that Paul wanted to be in Jerusalem by Passover, and his passion was to go there and to share the good news with the Jews that Jesus died for our sins. And so the whole focus of chapter 21, and you actually begin to come to the end of the book in chapter 21, when it focuses on Paul going to Jerusalem, his being arrested, his being sent to Rome, and he ends up there in prison in Rome in the end of the book. And so in chapter 21, verse 1, follow with me. And it came to pass that after they, after we, excuse me, were gotten from them. So the them there is a reference to the pastors, the elders, the deacon or the bishops or the overseers as he prayed with them and ministered to them. And notice that we begin also what is known in Acts as the we sections. It says that after we had gotten from them. So that is a reference to Luke himself, the author of the book of Acts. So whenever you have the we sections, it indicates that Luke, the author of the book of Acts, is now traveling along with Paul. So after we had gotten from them, that, that, that is the pastors in Ephesus, and we launched, we came with a straight course unto Kos, and the day following we went to Rhodes, which is the island there in the Mediterranean, and from thence we sailed unto Petra, and finding ship sailing over to Phoenice, we went aboard and we set forth. Now when we had gone, when we had discovered, or when we saw the island of Cyprus on the left-hand side of the boat, on the left-hand side of the boat, we sailed unto Syria. Now this is the Syria uh, where Paul came out of in his third missionary journey and his first missionary journey, and for that matter, his second, all three of his missionary journeys it's kind of the uh, home base there. And so he says, we landed in Tyre, which is along the northern coast of Israel, and there the ship was unloaded of her burden. And finding disciples, verse 4, we, Luke speaking, tarried there for seven days, took seven days to unload this merchant ship and to reload the merchant ship. And so Paul used this time to find believers to fellowship with. It says, there were believers that said to Paul, notice verse 4, through the Spirit, that he should not go to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and we went our way, and they all brought us on the way, and the wives and the children, till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore, and we prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we took ship and we returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tartire, we came to Puteolus, and we saluted the brother, and we abode there for one day. And the next day we departed, and we came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, that did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And he was come, he came unto us, he took Paul's, my King James Bible has girdle, a better translation is belt. You might read that and think, what is Paul wearing a girdle for? Bound his own hands and feet and said, thus saith the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle and should deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. And when we, had, when, when we had heard these things, Luke includes himself here, we both and they that of the place besought him 
not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered and said, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound in Jerusalem, but to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, The will of the Lord be done. Now I'm going to stop right there. Paul has been meeting here in Miletus with the pastors from Ephesus. The journey started out in Antioch. This is known as Antioch of Syria. And they went across Galatia, modern Turkey, sailed from Ephesus. They went up into northern Greece, which is Macedonia, Philippi, Berea. They did the ministry here. Came all the way down to Corinth. We have the letters to the Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. And then they sailed back, covered through a little, little isthmus here, sailed back up here. And then they sailed across this top corner of the Aegean Sea, back to Troas, Asos, came down by coast, and then they ended back up in Miletus. So from Miletus, here's tonight, in the first, first three verses, they sail by this little island of coast. They're hugging the coast. They go by the island of Rhodes. I've been to Rhodes a couple of different times, just a beautiful, beautiful little Greek island. And then they sail along the Mediterranean back to what is known as Israel, but this is the northern area today of Lebanon, Tyre, and then they travel down to Caesarea, and then they're going to go to Jerusalem, where Paul is going to be arrested. And that's going to constitute the third missionary journey in the travels of Paul. And you really ought to familiarize yourself with the geography of the Bible and the travels of Paul. I know that may seem kind of boring to some people, but it helps you to kind of get a feel for the areas that Paul has traveled. So verses 1 down to verse 3, as I showed you on the map, they're sailing by coasts and they come down by the island of Cyprus. And uh, then they come to this area of Tyre. And finding disciples, we tarried for seven days. It said unto Paul through the Spirit. Now, this is a section that Bible students go a little crazy on. They have a lot of fun debating this big issue. And I kind of got into it again today, and all these years I've gone over it, but the issue of was Paul in the will of God in going to Jerusalem, even though the Spirit had warned him, and what might look like in this English translation that the Spirit was telling him not to go to Jerusalem. Some people conclude that Paul was out of the will of God. Paul, why would you go to Jerusalem if everywhere you go, the Spirit is warning you and telling you that bonds and afflictions are waiting for you? Would you go into a certain town if the Lord made it clear to you that when you got there, you were going to be beat up and arrested and thrown into prison? You'd probably go the opposite direction, right? But we're not Paul the Apostle. And I believe that Paul knew that it was the will of God. And that he was in the will of God and he was trusting God to work out his plan for his life. I see in these first 16 verses, and we haven't got quite to 16 yet, we stopped at verse 14, I see some important lessons that we're going to see about the will of God and discerning the will of God and that the will of God can involve suffering and it can involve hardships and it can involve a cross and difficulty. So it says, finding certain disciples there. So they came, verse 3, to Tyre, which is on the northern coast of Israel in modern-day Lebanon. And it says, verse 4, finding disciples there. Now that little phrase in verse 4, finding disciples, indicates that they looked for them. They sought them out. And it may sound basic and elementary, but I want to encourage you, look for Christians, look for believers, seek them out, become a part of them. Whenever I'm talking to a young believer and he's wanting to know, you know, how do I grow in the Lord and how do I walk in the Lord and how do I, you know, live the Christian life, I'm always encouraging him, come to church, be in fellowship, get a get in a part of a small group, a discipleship group, and meet other Christians. You can't do it alone. You can't do it in isolation from other believers. We need one 
another. We need to encourage one another. We need to, as the Bible says, provoke one another to love and good works. We usually just provoke one another. We're to provoke or stimulate or encourage one another to love and to good works. And you need to be around Christians and fellowship with Christians. Now, the phrase we sought them out, as I said, it indicates they found them, they sought them out. It indicates that they went looking for these believers. So I believe that Paul didn't know any Christians there, and he went looking for them. And the minute he found them, they probably hugged, they smiled, they embraced, they talked. And the moment they started sharing together, their hearts were knit together in Christian love. You ever have that experience? You meet a Christian somewhere and all of a sudden, you just I found a brother in Christ. My dad served in, in the Coast Guard in World War II. And he was stationed in the Aleutian Islands. And as a boy growing up, he'd always tell me his Aleutian Island World War II stories, you know, and he sailed. The, and he, he was a Christian on this ship. And he didn't have any Christian friends on this ship. He was all alone. So it was just him and his Bible. But he always told me about when he would ever would come into port, that all the guys would get off the ship and they would head right for the places to drink and the houses of ill repute. And, you know, they would go do their thing. And he would go alone walking through town looking for a church. Looking for a church that might be having a service or looking for Christians or looking for believers because he wanted fellowship. His heart was starving for fellowship. And he said there were those times when we would come into port and I couldn't find any other believers and I'd go back to the ship all alone and I would pray and cry and read my Bible and talk to the Lord. But you know, when you're isolated from other Christians, your heart gets hungry. I don't know about you, but even as your pastor, when I haven't been in church in a, a week or so, or I have to miss a Sunday because I'm somewhere else, I can't wait to get back to this place. I can't wait to worship with you and study the Word with you and pray with you and encourage one another in the Lord. Sometimes do a study of the one another's in the Bible. I'm going to do a sermon series someday, Lord willing, on the one another's of the Bible. The Bible says that we love one another, that we forgive one another, that we pray for one another, that we wash one another's feet, that we bear one another's burdens, it's kind of hard to do the one another's if there's no others, right? <laughs> so don't be a lone ranger. Find a church. And not only find a church, but in all my years of pastoring, I've seen the benefit of finding a home church. A place where you call home and you're being fed and taught and you're serving and you're giving and you're praying and you're participating and you're part of the fellowship. The word is Koinia it means joint participation in our fellowship with God and with one another. So I love this picture of Paul. He's bound and determined to get to Jerusalem, but he's not so busy that he can't take the time to stop and he can't take the time to seek out, verse 4, finding disciples. What an awesome thing that is. And so we tarried there for seven days, which would indicate that they probably gathered on the Lord's day, that they were there on Sunday. And many believe that it was seven days because it took that long for them to unload. He was on a commercial ship, and they would unload the cargo, and then they would load more cargo, and Paul spent that time there with them. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed, and we went our way, and all they were there in Troas, they brought us, they brought Paul the Apostle, or Tyre, excuse me, they brought Paul the Apostle and Luke and the other in the company down to the beach or to the harbor where they were going to see them get bo on board the ship and see them off. And there's another beautiful kind of fellowship beach scene where they gathered together. It says, they gathered together, they brought us on our way with their wives and their children till we were out of the city and then we knelt down on the shore, and we prayed. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Notice that this is a family fellowship. This is the wives and the husbands and the boys and the girls and the children, and they're all gathered together. And what did they do with Paul as they gathered on the beach? They prayed. 
I want to encourage you tonight when you're with Christians, stop and pray together. Pray before your time together. Pray during your time together. Pray at the end of your time together. And as I read that today, I want to encourage you too. When you come to church, you know, pray before service starts. Pray at the end of service. I love when the church service is over and instead of just people running for their life, sometimes it looks like rats fleeing a sinking ship, you know. <laughs> Thank God I'm free at last, you know. And the doors open and whoosh, they go flying out. Maybe the sermon's too long or boring, I don't know, but they just want to get out of here. And then there's others that just kind of want to linger, you know, in the afterglow, and we almost have to kick them out of the church and turn the lights off to get them out, you know. But I love that. I think that's awesome. And I love seeing little groups of Christians praying around the sanctuary. And after service is over, if you're with somebody, go, let me pray for you this week, for your week, and let me pray for you, and you pray for me, and we pray for one another Take the lead, grab some other Christians and pray the message and pray what you heard through the word and what God spoke to your heart. Get little prayer groups and praying one for another. And that's the picture I see here is all the, the husbands and wives and all the kids and they're all kneeling and they're praying on the beach. And I, I wonder how they pray. I wonder if they didn't pray selfishly and say, Lord, we just pray that maybe Paul will change his mind and stay a little longer. <laughs> and maybe the... Sail will break on the ship and they'll have to spend a few more days so that we can fellowship a little longer together. Lord, we just pray that your will be done though. And they prayed for Paul and he prayed for them. And it doesn't say it in the text, but I'll bet you anything that there were tears. That they cried and they wept. What they heard in verse 4 is that Paul through the Spirit should not go up to Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to say more about this in just a moment, but this is the one point in the book of Acts where people are thrown for a curve, because in the English translation it says that they said through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. So when you read that, you would conclude, well, there are the Holy Spirit's telling Paul not to go. But in the Greek and in the grammar and the construction of that, and it supports what I believe to be the other references to the problems that Paul would get in Jerusalem, I believe that what is happening is the Spirit showed them and told them that Paul was going to be arrested and he would be persecuted in Jerusalem. But the Spirit didn't tell them to tell Paul not to go. So grammatically, when you study that, and then it ties in with some other passages we're going to get in just a moment when he gets to Caesarea, and Agabus prophesies that he'll be bound in Jerusalem, Agabus doesn't tell him not to go. Agabus doesn't say, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not go to Jerusalem. So I think that what is happening is, is that God, listen to me carefully, I'm going to tie all these loose ends together tonight. I believe that God is showing Paul what's going to happen when he gets there. That doesn't mean it's not God's will. I want you to think about this for a minute. You can be in the will of God and suffer. If you wrote that quote down and you got nothing else but that tonight, that's worth the price of coming to church, whatever gas it costs you to get to church tonight. You can be in the will of God and suffer. Now, you may not like to hear that, and they may, they may not get you all excited. You, nobody's jumping up and saying amen right now. Amen. Preach it, brother. It's not what's being preached. It's not what's popular. But I believe that it's what's in the Scripture. And I'll say it right now, and I'll come back to it again. When Jesus Christ was crucified on a cruel cross, he was sped upon, he was whipped, he was beaten, he was arrested. And by the way, a great parallel between Paul setting his face to Jerusalem and the Bible tells us in Luke's Gospel that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem and he would not be deterred. When Jesus died on the cross, was he in the will of God? You betcha he was. God had predetermined before the foundations of the world that Jesus would die on a cross. 
And what, what makes us think that if the Son of God, in the will of God the Father, doing his work, had to suffer and die, that we get to avoid that, or that we might not experience that? The issue isn't, does it make me happy? Does it make me comfortable? The issue is not even, do I think that it's where I'll be most useful or fruitful? The issue is, is it God's will for my life? And if it is God's will for your life, nothing should deter you or distract you from being obedient to God's will. So many times, even in little things, we don't... We don't want to do God's will. I know it's God's will for me to be honest on the job, but if I am, I'll lose my job. Lose your job and be in the will of God. If I'm in the will of God and I you know, do what God's called me to do, I'm going to be persecuted or laughed at or mocked or ostracized. I'd rather be in the will of God and suffer than be out of the will of God and prosper. It's so important to know that God's will can involve suffering and adversity and difficulty. And so I don't believe that the Spirit was telling Paul not to go. I believe that he was just warning him about what was going to happen when he got there. Now, we remember when Paul, at that time Saul, was converted on the road to Damascus. And he went in Damascus and he was there blind and Ananias came and laid his hands on Saul to receive his sight. God told Ananias, you go to him if he's a chosen vessel. And God said, for I will show him what great things he will suffer for my namesake. God actually said that at the beginning of his ministry. So living for Jesus and following Christ isn't always a bed of roses. Sometimes there's thorns on those roses. God calls missionaries to go to difficult places where sometimes they are persecuted. Sometimes they suffer. Sometimes they die. But it's being in the will of God that is the most important. So, they prayed. Paul says, we took, verse 6, ship. We took ship and they returned home again. What a contrast. Paul and his party, again we with Luke, verse 6, got on the ship and they went back to their homes. You know, sometimes it's harder to go back to your home than it is to get on the ship. Sometimes it's harder to get on the ship than it is to go back to your home. But whatever God's will is, some people, God's will is to get on the ship and to go. Some people, God's will is to go back home and to minister there where God has planted them. Now, when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Putumus, and we saluted the brethren, it's actually Puteolus. And the brethren again were saluted, and we abode with them for one day. Again, this is still up north. It's modern-day Akov. And it says, The next day we were of Paul's company, departed. We came to Caesarea. This is called Caesarea Mamertime. It's the Caesarea along the coast. And we visited there in February when we were on our tour. It was the seat of the Roman government. So they came to Caesarea. This is on land that he traveled actually from Tyre down the coast. They didn't sail down the coast. They traveled by land, came to Caesarea. And that's the seaport of Jerusalem. So he could go from there anytime he wanted into Jerusalem. And that's where, of course, they were predicting that he would suffer and that he would actually be persecuted and arrested. Now, as they were in Caesarea, they stayed at Philip the Evangelist. Now again, we come back to Philip. The name Philip means lover of horses. Interesting name. When we first met Philip, you remember in Acts chapter 6, when they chose these seven, we call them deacons or men, to wait on tables. Two of them we're well familiar with. One of them is Philip, and the other one is the man Stephen, who became the first Christian martyr who died for his powerful preaching. But Philip was the one who went down to Samaria, and God used him in a revival there. And then he went out to Gaza, and he preached to the Ethiopian eunuch who was riding his chariot, and he came alongside to him and shared the gospel from Isaiah, and he baptized him. And then Philip was caught away, 
up the coast. And evidently, he landed in Caesarea, and he met a fine young lady to marry. And they got married, and they had children. It says that he had four, excuse me, daughters who were unmarried. They were virgins, which did prophesy. By the way, in verse 8, Philip is the only person in the Bible actually called an evangelist. The word evangelism is used a couple of other times, only a couple of other times, but this is the only time a person in the Bible is actually called evangelist. And I'm sure that Philip these years was actually a busy doing the work of evangelism. And so he had four daughters, and they were unwed, and they did prophesy. Now, that's always been a fascinating thing that here these daughters of Philip had the gift of prophecy. And that's all it says. I don't fully know how they prophesied or when they prophesied and how it all worked. But even in the book of Corinthians, it indicates that women in the church can prophesy, has the idea of their head being covered and so forth. I think they need to be under the authority of a pastor in the church. But they were these young girls that prophesied. And so as we tarried there for many days, they came down from Judea, a certain prophet. So he doesn't go right off the bat to Jerusalem. He hangs for a while in this coastal town of Caesarea. And from Judea, down in the area of Jerusalem, comes this other prophet named Agabus. And when he was come, he took us And he took Paul's girdle or belt, and he bound his own hands and his feet. And he said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle, and shall deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. Now this is kind of like Old Testament prophet stuff, where sometimes they would get very, you know, demonstrative, and they would go through kind of little annex and do little kind of uh, show-and-tell things for their prophecy. So this prophet Agabus comes, and he takes Paul's belt, and he ties up his hands. And then he says, Thus saith the Lord, so shall the man who owns this belt be bound when he gets to Jerusalem. Now again, he doesn't tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem. He just tells Paul what's awaiting him in Jerusalem. This is going to be what happens to you when you get to Jerusalem. Interesting, too, that Philip had four daughters that prophesied, but they weren't the ones that prophesied about Paul's being bound. Agabus came from Jerusalem, and he's the one that prophesied about him being bound. Now, when they heard that, they were there at Philip's house, and they heard that. It says, verse 12, when we heard these things, both we and they of that place... So now Paul is surrounded by Luke, his traveling companions, and all these believers, and they're crying, and they're pleading, and they're whining, and they're begging, Paul, please don't go. It's like having kids with tears running down their eyes. Please, can we go to Disneyland, you know? It's time to go to bed, you know, and they can't do what they want to do, and they're crying, and they're... You know, they're all just gathered around Paul and they're begging him and pleading him. Now, we all wrestle with the will of God, right? We all sometimes wonder, is this the will of God? Is that the will of God? What's the will of God? And sometimes we look to our friends. You know, what do you think? What should I do? What if Paul would have looked to his friends right there? Well, it's pretty clear what they wanted him to do, right? Paul, don't go. We don't want you to get arrested. We don't want you to be in trouble We don't want you to die in Jerusalem. We don't want you to be put in prison. And they're weeping and they're crying. And sometimes when it comes to the will of God, one of the things that we often do, and it's okay to do that if we're careful about who we go to, we get counsel from people. We bounce things off friends. What do you think about this? But you need to be careful that you don't base God's will for your life on what other people think or say. That's a point you need to hang on to. You don't base God's will for your life on what other people think or say. You have to be confident of what you know God is calling you to do and not let other people influence you. So they begged him not to go, verse 12, to Jerusalem. And what was Paul's response? 
Paul answered verse 13, what mean you to weep and to break my heart? It's actually trying to, trying to soften me up here. <laughs> you, you know, you, you think these alligator tears are going to change my heart? Paul was a man who was determined. Paul would not be deterred. Now don't, don't, don't get me wrong, Paul wasn't perfect. He was a fallible human being and he could make mistakes. That's one of the arguments for those who think that Paul was out of the will of God. Is he was an apostle when he wrote Scripture. He was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But it's very possible that Paul could make a mistake. But I don't believe that in this case, Paul was making a mistake. Agabus did not tell Paul not to go. He just told him what awaited him. And so Paul says, I am ready. Remember when Paul said to the Romans, I am ready to preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So Paul says now here, I am ready not only to be bound in Jerusalem, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, and I, I love that, I've highlighted that in my mouth, he would not be persuaded. Now again, I realize there are those that will disagree with me and say that Paul was you know, being hard-nosed and stiff-necked and you know, he's a stubborn person and we all know people like that that want to do what they want to do. I think that Paul basically just had a consuming love for his brethren, the Jews, and a consuming desire to fulfill the will of God for his life. And he didn't care what happened. He didn't care if he was going to be arrested. He didn't care if he was going to suffer. He was doing God's will, and he wanted to be obedient. So he says, I'm willing to be arrested. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. My question for you tonight is, are you ready? You go, I am not. Are you ready to come to church in an air-conditioned car in an air-conditioned sanctuary? and hear a message, but are you ready to do the will of God? If God was calling you to go somewhere or to do something where you're going to face opposition or persecution or difficulty or misunderstanding, you could view this whole chapter actually as the misunderstood missionary. And you know, whenever you do anything great for God, or you venture a faith for God, let me promise you, you will be misunderstood. And you will be criticized. And you will be opposed. So you need to be sure that you are hearing God's voice and you're doing God's will. And you're not doing the thing of, wow, I wonder what's going to make my friends happy. Or I wonder what is going to make me comfortable. I wonder what's going to make me prosperous. I, I wonder what's going to make me rich. You have to be able to say, I wonder what is God's will for my life. I've always thought that, that that's just the most important thing of anything is, God, what is your will for me? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to be? I belong to you, Lord. I, I, I want to live for you and serve you. And I don't want to waste my time. I want to invest my time. So I love Paul's determination, his unwavering faith. He had a commitment to God's will and he had trust in God. All of this that is seen in Paul is because he believed God and he trusted God and he was resting in God. He believed in God's love and care and providence and will is good for him. And so he wanted that. And so it says in verse 14, one of my favorite verses in the book of Acts, and when he would not be persuaded... We stopped saying the will of the Lord be done. And we ceased trying to persuade him. And we said the will of the Lord be done. Again, take note of that statement. And I believe the will of the Lord was done. And I believe that one of the most important things that we could ever do is actually say in our prayers, thy will be done. Not my will but thy will. Somebody you love in the hospital, somebody you want, love is maybe sick, somebody you love is maybe going to die, and we want so bad to see God heal them and raise them up, and you can pray that God would heal them and raise them up, but when you finish your prayer, 
you need to have enough faith and trust in the providential care and grace and sovereignty of God to say, God, not my will, but thine be done. That's what takes faith. It doesn't take faith to tell God what to do and demand God that I should have a healing or I should get that new job or I should have that raise. What does take faith is say, Lord, no matter what, even if they throw me in this fiery furnace, I will not bow down. I will not bend. I will trust you. Even if they throw me in this den of lions, Daniel slept better in the lion's den than the king did out of the will of God. The king walked in his palace all night up and down, wore out his carpet, while Daniel had a lion for a pillow. And when the disciples were sent out on the Sea of Galilee by the Lord, and a storm came, and they thought they were going to sink and die, and Jesus came to them in the storm, they were safer in the boat in the storm than they would have been on the land. You're safer in a storm in the will of God than you are on the shore out of the will of God. That's why when you think about your life, your marriage, your job, your children, everything that involves your life, the safest place for you to be is in the will of God. And to know that God loves you and God's in control and that God has a purpose and that God has a plan. And I love that. They said, okay, we stopped trying to pester him and persuade him and we just said the will of the Lord be done. Now let's wrap this up. I'm only going to get to verse 16 and that's what I had planned on doing. He said, after these days, we took up our carriages, King Jimmy, and it actually means our luggages or our baggage, and we went to Jerusalem. So finally, he heads off to Jerusalem, like Jesus, who set his face to go to Jerusalem. And there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Mason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge there. Now, I want you to take note at the end of verse 16, or you could put it at the end of verse 17, but right here, verse 16, 17, is the end of the third missionary journey. So there were three journeys. First journey, second journey, third journey. This is the end of the third missionary journey, verse 16. And when he had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Now, why was Paul so set and determined to go to Jerusalem? Well, when you get a chance, read Romans chapter 15 and you read from verse 25 down to verse 29. And Paul shed some light on his desire to go to Jerusalem, and he was collecting in the areas he traveled an offering from the Gentiles to give it to the Jews, to show the Jews in Jerusalem that the Gentiles were one with them and loved them. And we'll pick that up when we continue our study in the book of Acts. But what I want to do is wrap this up in showing that there's a fantastic parallel between Paul, who set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing that he would be arrested, that he would be tried, that he would suffer and be in prison, and the parallel of Jesus, who set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing that he would be arrested and that he would be tried and that he would suffer on the cross for the sins of the world. And the lesson that's so important for us is to know that you can be in the will of God and suffer. Now, there was pressure from Paul's friends not to go. And the first reason that Paul got pressure from his friends, because his acquaintances or his friends, friends demonstrated the all too common inclination of being quick to know God's will for someone else. Isn't it funny how we know God's will for other people. That's not God's will. That's not God's will. And other people know God's will for us. How quick these people that surrounded Paul seem to know, you know, that's not God's will for your life. And it's like, well, thanks for telling me, you know. And I think God has your phone number. And God can speak to your own heart. The second reason his friends were trying to persuade him is because the well-meaning believer friends of his were trying to make God's will conform to their pre preconceptions of what God's will is. You say, well, what, what do you mean by that? And I, 
I can't tarry on. I've already taken more time than I want to. But the idea that people, I see this all the time, that God wants me to be happy. I'm not happy. Therefore, I'm out of the will of God. You know how many people I've had come to me in their marriages that say, God wants me to be happy. And I'm not happy in my marriage. So I'm out of the will of God. No. Where does in the Bible says God wants you to be happy? Second flesh alonians? <laughs> I don't see that in the Bible. God wants you to be obedient. And if you're obedient, you'll be happy. God gives the best to those who leave the choice to Him. I meet people that I meet people that say, "Well, God wants me to, you know, prosper," and I'm not prospering, so I must be out of the will of God. <laughs> you can be in the will of God and suffer. Do you know you can be in the will of God and get sick? You can be in the will of God and get cancer. You can be in the will of God and lose your job. You can be in the will of God and get in an automobile accident. You can be in the will of God and your car won't start. I mean, it has nothing to do with the will of God. I've told you before about my story. Years ago, I was on my way to Australia and we prayed and we planned and we were going to Australia to preach and we had conferences to do. Long story short, we went to Australia. We went down to LAX to get on the plane. Before we got on the plane, we went to a restaurant outside the airport and we got kidnapped in the parking lot at gunpoint. So for three hours, we're in a car, you know, with guns in our head and everything like that. And uh, finally, long story short, we got out of the car. The, you know, we got saved and we got home and everybody's like, don't go to Australia. Don't go to Australia. Don't go to Australia. You're out of the will of God. You know, God doesn't want you. In, obviously, God doesn't want you in Australia. So no, God wants us in Australia. The devil doesn't want us in Australia. So the next night, we got another plane and went to Australia and because we were kidnapped, we were celebrities in Australia. <laughs> we got on radio stations and did interviews and all kinds of cool stuff. God opened the doors because we got kidnapped in Australia. But I remember so many people saying, oh, Pastor John, obviously God doesn't want you to go to Australia. No, God wants us to go to Australia. He wants us to do this ministry. And just because we're being persecuted or opposed, that doesn't mean that we're out of the will of God. So they wanted to persuade Paul not to go because of their own benefit. We want Paul. We need Paul. Paul's a blessing to us, so we don't want Paul to go to Jerusalem instead of the will of the Lord be done, which is ultimately what they finally said as they trusted God and His will. Now, remember when Jesus was in Gethsemane and uh, He prayed and agonized, sweat drops of blood, and he said, Father, if it would be your will, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but what? Your will be done. And it wasn't the Father's will for him to, to avoid the cross. He went to the cross. He suffered and he died. That he might redeem us by his blood. So as you take communion tonight, you eat this bread and you drink this cup. I want you to all remember that Jesus came from heaven, went to a cross, suffered and died in the will of God. And it doesn't mean that you're going to be miserable and unhappy and you're all going to suffer and die. But it means that the best place for us to be is in the will of God, doing the work of God. And God will speak to us through His Word, by the inner witness of His Spirit, through the circumstances. But you have to live by faith. You have to trust Him. You have to believe in His promises that He will never leave you or forsake you. That His will is perfect. That He has an awesome plan for your life. And every time I take communion, I, with a thankful heart, just remember, this is what Jesus did for me. Now let my life be a living sacrifice for Him. Let's pray.